Good afternoon, everyone.
reflecting over the last few days about what it means to bless God's name. And I just think, you know, what can we give God that he doesn't already have? He's the creator of the world. He's all-knowing, all-powerful. The thing we can give him is ourselves and our time. And we choose to do that because we realize we have received a gift that we can never repay. And so we praise him. We bless his name because we are grateful for what we understand we've received. And I just think about the, the words of the next song we're about to sing. And the words are, you know, before we had a, our first breath, God breathed his, breathed his life into us. And before we said our first word, God was singing over us. And I just think we've got so much to be grateful for. So let's just focus on that this morning.
show us how much God loves us and how much his love is not only unconditional, it's unconventional. He would go to great lengths so that you would know how much he loves you. So we're going to put the, the lyrics back up on the screen for this bridge. Maybe you just need to read it. Maybe you need to sing it almost trembling like I am <laughs> and really believe it. So these words are powerful. Let's do it. There's no shadow you won't light up. who's in this room watching online so that we could know this kind of love. So God, I pray, that is my prayer, that everyone could experience it. We wouldn't just read about it on a screen. It wouldn't just be head knowledge, but God, it would be in our hearts. Those words, those powerful lyrics would make their way from our head to our heart today. So God, thank you so much your love. We are grateful, like Kyle said. We really are grateful. Amen. I just wanted to share with you a story that happened to me a couple weeks ago. And this is just a, a picture of God's love. Sometimes we, you know, God speaks to us in different ways. And and um, I was having a conversation with a friend about making, having to make a hard decision. And it felt really heavy. Um, yeah, I just went home even after. And I telling Justin, I said, oh, it just feels so heavy and I feel so discouraged. And in that conversation, I was like, I just feel like I'm in the driver's seat and I have to make this hard decision. What am I going to do? And I just, it was really heavy for me then. And um, the next day I woke up and I, I opened the version app, which Justin and, and Bill talk about often. It's an app, it's a Bible app. And, and I opened to the verse of the day and I kid you not, it said, I am in the, in, in Matthew, it says, I am in the driver's seat. You don't have to worry. I'm in the driver's seat. How specific is that? <laughs> and to me, right then in that moment, of course, tears, telling Justin, come read this. I was just telling you this yesterday. That was God's love to me in that moment. And I feel like sometimes, you know, we just need a picture of what God's love could be for you. And it could just be a simple word like that. I mean, just opening the Bible, driver's seat, and just the burden lifting from my shoulders. That is God's love. And I don't know if you know God's love right now. Maybe you'll experience it for yourself. Maybe you have experienced it for yourself, even while we're singing. Or maybe you'll feel it in the lobby, maybe at the grocery store. But God's love is everywhere. And he's trying to reach you. He's trying to connect with you because he loves you that much. So I just wanted to share that because that is, was such a beautiful depiction for me of God's love in my own life. I just want to encourage you with that, that he is there, he understands, he wants to love and connect with you as well. So I'm going to invite you now to grab a seat as we continue. Thanks so much for singing with us, worshiping every week from week to week. We love it. Thanks again. At this time in our experience, we're going to do something a little unique. Um, we have 10 families that are dedicating their children unto God. And uh, we are so excited about this. And um, maybe you've never heard of this, or maybe you were part of our experience a few months back when we did it. But ultimately, we are motivated by the life of Jesus. And when we look at his life, 
we see how um, all throughout his life he mentioned children so many times. So many times he would use them in his stories. And uh, one time in particular in Matthew chapter 10, one of my favorite stories, we see how some parents brought their children to be blessed by Jesus. And um, uh, the disciples thought, you know what? Jesus is too busy. Just stay, stay away. And Jesus did something amazing. He uh, turned to the disciples and he told them to stop. And not only that, but he welcomed the children unto him and he blessed them. And uh, not only that, but then he actually used children as an example for you and I and how we are to have childlike faith. Just absolutely amazing to see how Jesus welcomed children. And so because he did that, we do that as well. And today we are blessing and dedicating uh, 10 families uh, as, they, as they give their children in, in dedication to God. And this service, we have two of the families right here. Will you welcome them with me this afternoon? So over here we have a little Evelyn Irene Mueller, and this is uh, her parents, uh, Jamin and Ingrid. And uh, her name means beautiful and full of life. Hi. Hello. Hi. Yeah, that's awesome. Let's give them a big hand. Thank you, guys. And next we have Madden Michael Cranford. Awesome. And these are his parents, Tanner and Sarah, and his name means little hound and esteemed. Yeah. Hi, buddy. Hi, Madden. Oh, yeah, look at that. Let's give him a big hand. And uh, when we do this child dedication, there's really three parts. One part is how we pray and bless the children unto God. We just simply lift them up in prayer. The second part is for the parents. Uh, we've previously talked to them and uh, just talked to them about the importance of parenting, uh, not only in, in words, but also in action, and that they have dedicated uh, to raise these children to God and to lead them and direct them uh, towards living a life that is for Him. And the third is actually for you and I. Uh, and I want to encourage you today that you would help us create a safe space for these children to grow up in their faith. That they are allowed to make mistakes and they're allowed to journey in their faith and learn and gather community around them in good times and in challenging times as well. And so today, uh, will you join me if you're able to stand as we pray for these two families today? Just join me and stand if you can. So Father, I thank you so much for these two families. God, I thank you for their life. I thank you, God, for who they are today. I thank you, Lord, for these precious gifts, these awesome children, God, that you have so graciously given to us. Well, Lord, we understand that parenting is challenging. There are moments, God, where we need your wisdom and your understanding on what to do. So, Father, we just pray for both of these families, Lord. God, we pray that uh, in the days to come as these children um, go from children to toddlers to teenagers to adults, God, we just pray that you would be with them. Lord, as, as we do our very best in parenting and teach them and lead them in the way, God, we know that one day they too will have to make that decision to become a follower of yours. So Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give the families one more hand. Thank you, guys. And we have a small little gift for each of the families just to say thanks so much. All right, you can be seated today. Well, wow, thank you so much. Well, everyone, welcome to Central. My name is Tom Brady. I'm, oh, sorry. No, sorry. Sorry. Go Pats! Woo. Oh. Go Rams! Yeah. Go Halftime Show! Yeah, there you go. Go Chicken Wings! Yeah, no, I mean, we, can, we can be here all day. No, my name is John Paul. I'll be your host today. So excited that you guys decided to join us this afternoon, Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, we had so much going on. We even have more happening in just a little while. Uh, but hey, if you're new here, I just want to say welcome. And there's a couple of ways that we're able to connect with you. I just want to let you know that we are motivated by two things here at Central. First off, we're motivated to simply introduce a life of faith to you. And secondly, we're here to help you grow in that faith. And we just simply believe that no matter where you are in your journey, there is a place for you here. For you, here. you belong here. 
And uh, there's a number of ways you can do that. And if you were to simply take a moment and fill out the blue card that's found directly in the seat in front of you, simply fill out as much information as you feel comfortable with and immediately following this experience, you can take that card to the big blue wall in the lobby. If you have any questions or you wanna know about groups or how to grow your faith, they'll be able to answer it there. And they'll actually exchange that card for a gift. If you're also joining us online, we wanna say welcome. If this is your first time, please connect with the online pastor as well. Uh, they would love to be able to see who you are and if there's any way that we can help you out. And third, if you wanna just simply text the word connect to the number on the screen, uh, you'll be forwarded a link as well. You can do it that way. Well, at this time, I'd like to call the host forward as we get ready to give. Now, again, if this is your first time here, please feel no obligation to give. But if you did come ready to give today, there are a few ways you can do that on the screen as well. Now, I only have a couple of announcements for you today. First off, uh, we have our 2018 uh, tax receipts available for you uh, through email over the next couple of weeks. Now, I just want to take a moment and celebrate that. We live in a country that celebrates generosity. Not only does your generosity uh, help us impact our community and the surrounding area, but it also, the government acknowledges this, that uh, that generosity and you get a tax credit for that. And so if you wanna know more information about what that is, again, the big blue wall, someone there will be able to help you. But again, uh, your tax receipts for 2018 will be available in just a few weeks through email. Also today, we are starting a brand new series called Fake News. It's a practical guide to love. February's here, love is in the air. And we wanna debunk all the myths around love and relationships. Now we want this to be an interactive series. So one of the ways we are doing it is we want to encourage you to go on a date. Yeah, go on a date. Woo now we're not providing the person you go on the date with. We're not doing that. That's next month. Uh, but just kidding. Uh, we are actually, for those of you that have kids, we are providing a free childcare night for you. Yes, indeed, on Friday, February 15th, from the hours of 6 a.m. to, no, just kidding, from the hours of 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., come to the church, you can drop off your kids for free, and you have three hours to go sleep, to go to Costco, whatever you want to do for three hours, Friday, February 15th. Now, we do have limited spots, so there is a sign-up. So I want to encourage you to text the word date night to the number on the screen so that you can register. Look at all the phones right now. They're like, I'm not waiting. And it's awesome. Just a fantastic way. This series is going to be really great. So actually at this time, I'd like to call Pastor Justin up as we begin our series called Fake News. Welcome to Central, everyone. We're just living a more modern lifestyle. It's not lifestyle. a morality issue. So why not get better. married? What's the point? I learned about consensual non-monogamy. Uh, between our love of individualism and liberty on the one side and our love for and quest for community on the other side. Having all this go down in the public eye is a lot to deal with. The cheating scandal that shot the twilight out of all of us. They were calling it quits after almost nine years together. Here then are a few of the many good reasons to spend your life alone. Relationships spoil love. Being alone means not inflicting yourself on others. Well, good afternoon. How's everybody feeling today? Good, good. As uh, GP mentioned, it is Super Bowl Sunday. Let, let me ask you, how many of you could care less about the Super Bowl? Yeah. Okay, okay. Last, I, I had to go there because a couple of experiences ago, we had people yelling out, go Leafs, go. And I, I didn't know what was happening. So we got some haters uh, in the house. But hey, listen, how many of you are just in it for the food? That's you. You're, 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 okay, that's great. You're joining the 1.3 billion chicken wings being uh, consumed today. All right, that's a lot of chickens without wings. Uh, today we are starting a brand new series uh, called Fake News. And uh, before we kind of get into everything, I just want to say how glad I'm you're here. Uh, how glad I am that you are here. Uh, how glad that I'm here and glad that you're here. Uh, especially if you're here and you're supporting someone that was uh, being dedicated, one of our kids. And... Uh, my hope for you, as always, is, yeah, it's awesome that you could support someone else, but I also know that my hope is that you would experience a community that actually 
wants to support you. And they would support you on your faith journey. Wherever you're at in that journey, we are a group of people just kind of figuring it out. And none of us have it figured out, but we believe there's something about doing this together that is beautiful and powerful and meaningful. And so, uh, so glad that you could be here with us today. Uh, like I said, we are in a new series. And what we're going to be doing over the month of February is we're going to try to debunk uh, a lot of myths when it comes to things that have been submitted to us about love and relationships. And our hope is that we can kind of give you some really practical tools for you to put in your tool belt, your purse, your whatever, your man bag, whatever it is that you have, uh, that you could actually use these things to help you when it comes to how to navigate love, how to navigate relationships. And so we're going to really work through that over the course of the month. And so you're going to want to be here next week. Uh, next week's fake news is that uh, sex is a leisure sport. And so uh, if you are brand new here, you're like, wow, this just got real fast. Wow, Okay. Okay, uh, we're going to be talking about sexuality and intimacy, and so we're going to talk about why sex. That's, that's next week. Uh, the week three is fake news, is that it doesn't matter what I do. We're going to talk about why marriage and our choices and our responsibility, why, why do those things matter. And then week four is fake news, is we're going to talk about why love. Why do you love those, or should you just love those who love you? Uh, what do you do when people have hurt you and your enemies? And today's fake news is, is this, is, is that you don't need anyone. You don't need anyone. In fact, the path to happiness is autonomy, right? Isn't that what we're sold? That if you want to be really happy, the key is to not need anybody. That's the path. And if I was to pull the room right now, if I was to say, do you agree with that? Probably I would guess that most of you would be like, no, but most of us live like that. Most of us live like we don't need anyone. So we're going to unpack that today. And what's interesting is uh, I, I, I kind of did a bit of research on this and uh, this is actually bigger than a faith conversation. This is actually a bit of a societal, um, uh, becoming a bit of an epidemic, actually, and a bit of a problem that society, the mental health community, science is actually going, you know, there's, there's some things here that are actually affecting our society that we got to look at. So I, I came across this article, article in uh, Psychological Science from 2017, an article that was uh, written and, and conducted in the States. And what they found was really this, was when they found a formula that when you add it all up, it actually equals something pretty destructive. And so what they found was that if you were to add up the over 40% of people that are divorced in the, in the U.S., and it would be similar in Canada, if you were to add that to a rising individualistic culture, and then you were to also add that to the first time ever, over 50% of people, 50, 5, 0, 50% 50 of people unmarried, and then you were to also add that to one quarter of households having one single dwelling households, one person living in a house, if you were to add all of that, what they're, what they're learning and discovering is that the fabrics of relationships in our world are becoming totally impoverished. They're, they're becoming bankrupt. In, in other words, we're more alone than we've ever been. And maybe for some of you, you can identify with that because you feel that. You're more connected than you've ever been, and yet you feel like, man, I feel all alone. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm not even connected to anybody. And so in this... In this article, it was fascinating because it took me, I don't know if you, you go down deep rabbit trails or dark holes, I kind of, I found myself in this deep hole. But in this article, uh, it referenced a book called Bowling Alone. And I thought bowling was bad enough with other people, I can't imagine it alone, so I immediately started to read this book. That was a joke. Um, and so so I, I read, the, I started reading this book, and what's fascinating about it is the premise in this book is what they found with over looking at hundreds of thousands uh, of surveys, papers, uh, interviews, research that they did. They found that one of the most fascinating finds that could sort of encapsulate all of it was this, is that more, po more people are bowling than ever before alone. So 10% up in bowling, historically, 40% down of people that are actually doing it with others in leagues and those kinds of things. And so when they began to un unpack it, the premise was this, is that, and maybe you could check these and be a bit of a mental marker for you, is that people belong to fewer organizations than they ever have. Whereas maybe you, you saw 30, 40, 50 years ago, people were a part of all kinds of groups, groups to, to make the world a better place. We don't see that anymore. People know their neighbors less. Maybe you could check that one, right? Or, or people meet with friends less frequently. There's less family that live close by. We're busier than we've ever been. And if you have a problem, you don't call mom or dad anymore. You say, hey, Google, can you fix my life? It's struggling, right? Hey, hey Google, how do I make cheese dip for the Super Bowl? And it'll tell you. 
You don't have to call mom anymore. You don't have to call your dad. So, so this, is, this is an interesting dynamic for us because social media adds another layer that, again, social media is just amoral. It's not, neither good or bad. It's just a network that as your network grows, we find ourselves becoming more and more isolated. So, again, outside of the, the, the faith conversation in our society, what they're discovering, research is telling them, is it keeps pointing to the reality that support structures are actually the key to, to, to mental health. That when you don't have those things, ultimately when you go through the hard things in life, those things begin to break down in your, in your life. That's why if you're, if you're going through a diagnosis or you're going through death, and I know some of you have experienced that. Some of you are going through it right now. When it's really dark, you can't imagine it without someone else. That this is the place where actually our society is saying, listen, you're in for something really destructive if you don't have these relational ties. So... What's interesting is that suicide is on the highest rise, and we're going to talk about that uh, next month a little bit, but suicide is on the highest rise amongst people who live alone, who have minimal relational ties, and are are, are unmarried and and, and have these these, these ties that aren't there. They're broken relationships. So this is the challenge for us as relational beings. We were created for this. We know it. Something inside of us would say, yes. I know that I was made for this, and yet the lie I'm being sold, the fake news, is that I don't need anyone. So what do, I, what do we do with that? And I want to kind of walk you through this a little bit. What's interesting about us as humans is whenever we, we experience something, we have a tendency to react in extremes. Okay, so one of the, one of the most famous theologians, I believe, from, from the, the, the last century, the last hundred years, C.S. Lewis is his name, and he writes in a book called Mere Christianity, and this book, uh, if you want a place to explore faith and a great thinker, someone who could help you maybe with some of your, your thoughts, your doubts, your questions, this is a great, uh, again, a great read. But he says this. He says that lies are often introduced in extreme opposites. So let me say that again. Lies are often introduced in extreme op- opposites. So let me, let me uh, articulate it a couple ways, and then I'll, I'll explain it with relationships. Uh, Let's say for some of you who, you growing up, maybe you had a bad experience with someone who claimed to know God. Okay, maybe they said they were a, Christ, a Christian, a Christ follower, they went to a church, they were a leader, they were whatever. You had an experience that should have never happened. They said something, they did something, and it utterly disgusted you. It turned you off from everything to do with God. And what happened in your brain was there was a fight or flight response that kicked in and you, your choice was to either stay and fight it out and, and sort of separate it that maybe this wasn't God, this was just somebody being a human and making a mistake and shouldn't have done that. Or there was a part of you that said, I want nothing to do with this and you engaged your flight response and you believed that the answer was found in the opposite extreme. No faith, no church, nothing to do with anything to do with anything that I can't see with my physical eyes and what you found was utterly bankrupt on the other side. And maybe for you, even being here today or you watching online is, is part of you sort of reconstructing that to go, okay, I, I reacted in an extreme and it's actually not, there's no answer over here. So there's, there's got to be something down the middle that I could rebuild because I know that I'm a spiritual being. I know that I was created for, for more, connected to something bigger, but I just don't know what to do with that. Uh, we do the same thing in politics. Uh, if, again, if you've been around for any length of time, you, you, you could pretty much predict the pendulums now, Right? We have people who vote this way, and they say, yep, this is the answer. All of our problems are going to be solved. And what happens in four years? Everyone's, everyone's angry. Everyone's disgruntled, or eight years, and they say, okay, we're going to vote this way. And then they vote this way, and they're happy for two minutes. Yay, we got our guy or a girl. And then, uh, you know, shortly after, oh, yeah, it's the worst. This is the worst. We've got we're gonna, we're gonna to vote this way. And you see these pendulums, right, all these extremes. We do the exact same thing when it comes to our relationships, so right now, we're in a pendulum swing where the, the, the lie, the fake news that we're being sold is in its extreme individuality, that you don't need anyone. You don't need anyone. That's the lie we're being told. It's been perpetuated in everything. You don't need anyone. In fact, the, the truth is the goal no longer is to retire. The goal is to be autonomous, right? The goal is to not need to answer to anybody, not have to work for anybody, to work when I want to work, to do what I want to do when I want to do it, to have enough to say I'm going to do what I want to do when I'm going to do it, right? It, it's all about me. And the challenge with this, 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 this extreme is that what we've been sold is, is radical independence, 
which actually leads to ultimate isolation. And for many of us, it's a bankrupt place we find ourselves in. It's a place we don't want to be. Can you identify with that? There's probably for a lot of us in the room or watching online who would say, yeah, like, if I'm honest, I am emotionally or relationally, I'm impoverished. I'm bankrupt. So... There's something being perpetuated. I don't know if you feel it, but it's interesting. Even there's these subtle things that, you know, even when it comes to borrowing something, there's a part of us that goes, ah, I, should, I feel weird asking for, to borrow something. I should, you know, there's almost like this stigma, like, oh, you should have bought it on your own. Maybe you should have worked you know, a little bit harder and you could have bought it yourself, right? And there's these weird social stigmas. When you get married as a young person, there's this thing like, you should, you know, you should have everything already. You should have two cars and you should have a house. It should be fully furnished and you should do all the same holidays that your parents did after 25 years. And you should do all these things and, and, and we're sold like, and you don't even have to pay for it for like 80,000 months. You just zero down, right? And this is, it's perpetuating this idea that you don't need anyone. So the answer often we look for in the extreme and the other side of it is something we call collectivism. And in collectivism, the idea is that it's not about you, it's about the group. That, 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 that when the group wins over you, that's what it's all about. It's about success defined for the whole. It's you taking care of each other. And if you were to ever say, you know, dad or mom, like, I just want to find myself. Like, I'm just going to find myself. Like, I just really need to do that right now. Like, really? And, 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 then, and then your parent looks at you, if you, especially if you grew up in the East, or maybe you, you grew up in an immigrant family here, and they're, and they're like, excuse me, you're going to find yourself? You're going you're gonna to work for the family business. Like, what do you mean you're going you're gonna to find yourself? You're going to work for the company. You're going to work. It's about the family. It's not about you. It's not about, I'm going to find myself. You know, like, that's the, that's the way of thinking. Collectivism, right? So what do you mean? It's about restraining myself to fit the group. And the problem with this extreme is that what you'll find is, it, uh, is your individuality gets crushed in the extreme. That it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter your giftings. It doesn't matter your wiring. It doesn't matter that you make the world a beautiful place because of your diversity. Those things don't matter. Those things are crushed. And what you often find is power and control and using fear to keep you in line. So what's the answer then? Right? That's a... That's a Great place to get us to. What's the answer if the extreme is, I don't need anybody and nobody needs me? How do I navigate that? And that's what we're going to look at today. And, and, and so in, in the Bible, what's interesting is as we look to the Bible today as a bit of a guide, um, what it reveals is that actually both of these are important. So, so we see stories where uh, groups of people do things really beautiful together. In the beginning of the church, it says that people sold their possessions as each had need, and what did they do? It says that they, they gave out of their love for God and for others. They gave as each person had need. It was this beautiful exchange about the group. It was about you collective. And what's amazing about that is we're actually in a season as a church that's really beautiful as well. And it's beautiful because, not because of one all-star, not because of a singer, not because of somebody on a platform. It's beautiful because every one of us has this dream for a new property that we're just, things are blowing up, taking off on York Road and Niagara on the Lake. And we have this vision just to impact our region and everybody being involved in it. And if you're not involved, I want to encourage you, our, our family's involved. We, we give to it. We're a part of it because we believe that there's something about doing this together that we can't do on our own. So this is amazing. This is something that we celebrate. The Bible celebrates this. But it also celebrates you as the individual. We, we read and we sang about today. We read about the story of Jesus. Jesus tells us of the good shepherd. And we know that ultimately the good shepherd is, is God. And it says that the good shepherd actually leaves the 99 sheep. And he tells this parable of, you know, the shepherd who goes and he is ruthless. And he's relentless. And some would even consider it reckless in going to leave the 99 to go and to fight for the one. And it says that the shepherd would do anything to find the one sheep that was lost. And the Bible uses this picture to remind us that actually all of heaven rejoices when just one person finds life. When one person who was maybe lost and not sure where they were going was disoriented or living in chaos and they find the peace that God has created for them, they find relationship with God that says that all of heaven rejoices. So we see both of these things that are actually both important in the Bible. And in the middle of this, the Apostle Paul, who writes a lot of the New Testament, he writes this group of believers in a place called Corinth. And it's a real-life place. It's 45 minutes, or it's about an hour, actually, north of Athens. Uh, I was just there uh, recently. Uh, and it's fascinating because he writes them, 
and he says, he says to this group of people that are trying to figure out faith like you and I, and some of them are individual, and they're like, no, no, like, we just want to do this, like, we just want to do this, like, on our, by ourselves, because it's, like, a lot better that way. We could just discover our giftings. Sorry, I, I, got, I just got in a weird mood today in this experience only. You just had to endure that. Okay, anyways, it was people, people realizing, yeah, you know what, like, I'm going to do this by myself. I'm, I'm really sorry for that, by the way. Uh, people, you know, people say, I, I want to figure out faith, and, and it, I think it's an individual thing. And then there's a group of people saying, no, no, like, I think it's something we're meant to do together. And so they're, they're trying to navigate faith and life and relationships. And Paul writes them in the middle of all, the, all of this, and he has something he wants to challenge them with. He gives them this word picture. And I want to walk you through this word picture. And for some of you, this is a brand new word picture that's going to seem a little strange. Okay, I want you just to just track with me. It's a metaphor for something deeper that I want you to track with. Others of you, you've heard this metaphor your whole life, and you're going to be tempted to just let it go in one ear and out the, out the other, okay? I want you to just lock in with me for a second, okay? Can we do that together? And so we're going to start at the end, and we're going to work our way to the beginning of this passage, and here's why. If I go the other way, this was written to a group of people who thought collectively. You don't think collectively. You, you, you primarily think individually. So if I do it the opposite way... My hope is that you'll see that I don't actually want something from you. I want something for you. Okay? I don't want something from you. I want something for you. So we're going to go through it in reverse because I think it will help you see it. So here in 1 Corinthians, if you have a Bible, you can turn with me. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And if you have a phone, again, uh, we love the YouVersion Bible app. You can download that or go to BibleGateway.com or, or track on the screen as well. But here's what Paul says to us. He says this. He says, you... Uh, and this word you means you together, okay? It's not you, like I'm not saying you, you mean me. No, nope, not you, you. You collective, okay? You together are the body of Christ. So not you, the individual, you communal, you collective, you all of us together are the body of Christ. And maybe you're thinking, well, what do you mean the body of Christ? Like didn't Jesus come? He had a body. He was here on earth. He did his thing. He, le- you know, he, he died. He he left and, and, and he went to heaven. You know, isn't that sort of the body? No. Paul is explaining this paradigm to us. He's saying there's a new paradigm that you together are actually the physical representation of God. That you are the hands, you're the feet, you're the mouth, you're the ears, you're the eyes, you're all of those things of Christ. That when you do this together, you are participating in Christ. That on this side of heaven, this is the closest you get to Jesus when you participate together. Okay, so this is what he's prefacing by saying. And not only that, each one of you individually is unique, has a unique and vital part of it. So he's saying, actually, there's this paradigm where both of these things are significant. And they happen in the context of us doing this together, all playing a part in a body. That's the image, the image of a body. And he explaining, he's explaining that all of us are the physical representation. So here's, here's what this looks like. I, I think of two very easy examples. There is something amazing about when we collectively express uh, ourselves together as the body of Christ that can't happen when it's just you. I think of the, the beautiful things on this side of heaven that happen when we together are the best version of us, functioning together as the body, each contributing, each doing our part, each offering our gifts, each being connected. That There's something that happens. There's, there's hospitals that were built in the name of God because of people that connected get together. There are, there, there, there are universities that were started. There's education that happened. There's feeding programs. There's microloans. There's helping kids in need. There's missions trips. There's all of these things, you know, relief and hurricane relief. All of these things happen when people decide to do something together that they couldn't do on their own. That is the beautiful part about being part of this thing called the body of Christ. Individually, I think for a lot of us, we've bought, to, we bought into the lie that it's just my thing, right? We, we believe that I just say the prayer, you know, that somebody told me to pray, and I read the book somebody told me to read called the Bible, even though I don't know where to start, and, and, and I know some information, and I come here once a week, and, you know, I, and, you know, I might talk about it, I might not, but, the, but that's sort of the deal, right? And, and the challenge for it is somebody meets you, and they go, oh, like, well, like you're the representation of Christ, and then they start seeing that it doesn't take them long to see that there's actually some things that maybe aren't maybe the best, and you see the same in them. Sometimes individualistic, individually, we don't actually represent Christ the best, but collectively, 
there's something transcendent, there's something beautiful that happens that we were created for. And in this new paradigm, it's a paradigm where everyone is invited and everybody is important. So maybe if you're here today and you don't really know your place, can I invite you into this paradigm? It's something that we actually believe. It's a place where everybody's invited and everybody is important. Everybody's important. We actually believe that in this, in this kingdom. And so he begins to unpack it. And we're going to reverse a little bit. Verse 18 of, of 1 Corinthians 12. Here's what it says. It says, But God has carefully designed each member and placed it in the body to function as who? As God desires. As he created you, to be at your best is for you to function in him, the body that he's created you to be a part of. It says that a diversity is required. You see... The church at its worst has been when we just said, you need to be this. You need to be this template. You need to fit this mold. It's about the group. It's not about you. What you think doesn't matter. No, no, that's not what he's saying. He's saying a diversity is required for if the body consisted of just one single part, there wouldn't be a body at all. So now we see that there are many different parts and functions, but there is one body. So here's what I need you to understand today. Here's a real practical thing. I want you to just write it down if you want, or you could... Just take a picture of it, take a note of it, is this. Understand that you are indispensable. If nobody's told you that, or you've never heard that before, can I just tell you that you are indispensable. I didn't say it, God said it. That we need you. That we need you. That, that, that some of you have judged your value based on what other people's giftings are. You, you've judged your value on the fact that you don't do X, and you fill in that blank, Right? You don't speak, you don't teach, you don't uh, lead, you don't, uh, you look at this church, you say, oh, it's big, everyone, uh, there must be no need for me. Those are lies. Those are, those are actually lies, and, and you believe the lie that you're unqualified, and the truth is, just because you said it doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean it's true. Just because you lost your place doesn't mean you don't have a place in the body. Just because you haven't found it yet doesn't mean that you don't have a place. Just because that you used to have a place and you gave it up and you walked away doesn't mean that you don't have a place in this family. Just because you're brand new today and you're thinking, wow, like I didn't think I was getting into this, uh, doesn't mean that you don't have a place. Those are lies. It doesn't make you any less a part of the body. The only way to find your place is to do it with others, to try a whole bunch of stuff. So don't believe the lie that you don't fit because we need you. You do fit. You do fit. You have unique giftings that only you have that God has placed inside of you. So just because you think you don't doesn't mean it's true. Don't believe the lie that you don't fit. Don't believe the lie that the answer is to quit and to walk away. Don't believe the lie that the answer is just to go to another church because you're going to have to figure the same thing out there. That you are indispensable to God and to this community. You know, Think of it like this. Like, in our bodies, we all have these amazingly intricate bodies, and each part working together is what makes it beautiful. Like, you, you, you picture an eyeball. It's kind of gross on its own, right? It's a little bit disgusting, slimy, it's weird. And yet an eyeball, when it's functioning in the body, is amazing. It has this incredible ability to send information to your brain, and your brain processes that and sends information to your body and your extremities, and, and, you, and you're moved to action that it's at its best when we are functioning together, every single person doing their part. So God puts you in this body, and you're extremely important. And if you don't recognize it or you haven't realized it, let me help remind you today that you are an indispensable gift that God has created. So we're going to go back to verse 12, and and here's where Paul kind of unpacks it. He says, Just as the human body is one, though it has many parts that together form one body, so too is Christ. Okay, We're we're part of this thing with Christ. There's there's actually a spiritual dynamic that happens when when we do this together. For by one spirit we are all immersed and mingled into one single body. In fact, the human body is not one part, but rather many parts mingled into one. And so then he goes on, and I think this, is the, I think this was meant to be a joke to the, to the Greeks. I think they would have chuckled at this because of the absurdity of it. We're kind of serious when we read the Bible, so you don't, you don't have to be. But this is, I think this is what, uh, it was meant to be so ridiculous that it was to prove a point. And so he says, so if the foot were to say, since I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body, it's forgetting that it's still a vital part of the body. And if the eye were to say, since I'm not an eye, whoops, from the ear was to say, I'm not an eye, I'm not really part of the body, it's forgetting that it's still an important part of the body. Think of it this way, the whole body were just an eyeball, 
how would it hear sounds? And if the whole body were just an ear, how would it smell fragrances? So he's saying, listen, you're, you're a vital part of the body. And, and, and part two today, I want to leave you with this thought, is, is, is that in our practical guide, understanding that you were made to be connected. I don't know if you've thought about this in a while, but you were made to be connected, that you need you. You need you. You need this. We, you need us. We need each other. That this is, this is our reality. I, I was thinking of this, uh, this image. This is going to sound really weird to you, okay? So just bear with me. Imagine you're walking down the road, and on the sidewalk, you peer over, and you see uh, a human hand on the ground, right? What do you do? You freak out. I, I don't know if you're like me. I'd be like, that's a hand. That's a, what? Why is there a hand there? There's blood. The hand, it, it's like clearly a, it's not made up. It's not fit. There's a hand. You know, you're calling. You're like, what do I do? Like the 911, I see a hand. What do I do with this, right? Do I report it? Like there's something about that that grosses us out. If I brought a hand here or a foot, you would say, man, that's disgusting, or a tongue, or, or you know, like, what's, what's with us? And when we see extremities, like, that's gross, right, when they're not attached. Or if you have a piece of hair in your pizza during the Super Bowl, right? Isn't that disgusting? But that hair on your head is fine. So here's my point, is any time that you remove a body part from the body, it's gross. You know why? It's because it was meant to be connected. And actually, the same is true in your life. Anytime that you become disconnected, anytime that you remove yourself, it's actually gross. Not because you're gross. Maybe you are. <laughs> it's gross because it was never how it was meant to be. You were made to be connected. You were made for this. That anytime that you disconnect yourself, there's a part of you that starts to die. Because apart from the body, you begin to die. There's death at the end of that. That's, what, that's, the, that's the extremes in the polar extremes of those is death. And yet this is what we were created for. We're created for life. I was thinking about this. There's three questions you'll never be able to answer if you're not connected. I'm going to go quick on these. Three questions that you'll never be able to answer. I hear all these questions all the time. You'll never be able to answer these questions if you're not connected. And the first one is why don't I feel close to God? Right? Why don't I feel close to God? You know, when, when, the truth is, when you are connected together, you are part of the body, there is a closeness that happens. In fact, the, the scripture reminds us of this idea that it, it says, when two or more are gathered, it says that I am there in the midst of you. So there's a, there's a lot to that. There's context to that. But here's the, the, here's the deeper truth to it. When two of you are together, it means that you are part of a body, that you are more than one part. You're connected to the body, which means that God is there. When you're connected to the body of believers, that there's something that happens, there is something that on this side of heaven, this is the closest that you get to God. God is present in that. So when you disconnect, there's actually a part of you that is disconnecting from God because you were designed for this. You were made to be connected. So when people say, I don't feel close to God, I say, are you connected? Are you in a group? Are you, are you, are you volunteering? Are you plugged in? Are you invested? This is how you find your uh, presence of God. He's right there. He's present when we're gathered to, together. Second question that you'll never be able to answer if you're not connected is, why am I not growing? Why am I not growing? Let me ask you this. How much does a foot grow when it's not connected to the body? Zero. Right? Zero. It, it maybe gets bloated. Maybe it gets a little nasty. It gets a little gross. But it's not growing. It's not growing. So, so the same is true in your life. You know, for, for some of you, the truth is you used to be really connected you used to be really connected to this body. And maybe in your 20s and 30s, you were connected and you got busy and you decided, I'm going to prioritize other things. And now you're in your 50s and your 60s. And if you're honest, you're becoming a little bit disillusioned. Because you come and you sit and you leave. And you come and you sit and you leave. And there's a part of you that says, well, maybe this isn't the, ch like, maybe this isn't the church that I like, used to really like. And like, I, think the, I think the vision's changing here. Like, I don't know if I like that pastor, especially this one today. You know, like, and we, we start to point fingers, and I'm being facetious, but I'm proving a point that when you get disconnected, you stop growing. It's easy to point fingers instead of saying, actually, maybe I just got disconnected. Maybe I need to reconnect. Maybe I need to realize that my giftings that God has given me are becoming stagnant. They're dying, and I need to give them. That I'm actually hurting others because I'm not giving them. So why am I not growing? It's because you're not connected. I think the third question you can't answer if you're not connected is, what is my purpose? 
I see so many people trying to figure out their purpose outside of the body. Listen, I've tried to get away from the church. I love creativity. I love entrepreneurial stuff. I love all of those things. I can't get away from this place because it's the most meaningful. You see, autonomy was never the goal. It was never the goal. When you're connected to something bigger than you, this is actually where you find the life force. There's a, that's a weird word, but that's where you find the life that God has created you for. So, so let, me, let me ask you really just a couple key questions today. I want to challenge you with these. And the first one is this, is have you in your busy schedule, because you're all busy, whether you lead a country or you lead yourself, we're all busy. So have you in your busy schedule carved out time to be connected? And, and, and I would challenge you to actually take stock of it. Like, like what, what does your connection look like? You say, well, I, may, I give an hour a month. Okay, great, awesome. What would maybe two hours look like? Because there's something in you, maybe I, I, I have a sense that you're saying, I, I think I need to be more connected. Okay. So what would it look like for you to say, I'm going to come back next week? And, and maybe for you, you say, actually, in my family, I'm going to make this, this deal, 2019, we're going to plug in like we've never plugged in. We're going to get connected into groups. We're going to get connected and volunteer. You know what? We're going to go on a missions trip. You know, I talked to some people last week in our lobby, and it was amazing. Uh, one person had been on a trip. Uh, in the last year, another person going on a trip. You know what's amazing about people who go on missions trips? And if you don't know what that is, we just go and we help people uh, all around the world. And um, what's amazing is people who go on trips, before they go, they say a whole lot of things like I and I and me and my health and my money and my holidays and my time and, 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 and my food and, and, and I and I and I. And they go on the trip and they come back and you know what they say? They say, we, and we did, and we went, and God did, and we can't believe this, and what if we did this here, and we, and we, 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 all the way home? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that was weird. <laughs> right? It's we. And you know what they discovered? They discovered that there's something about expressing my indiv individuality in the context of a body that is what I was made to do. It's what I was made for. So I don't want anything from you. I want something for you. I want you to win. And for some of you, you're dying. Some of you young people, you believe the lie that it's all about you. Just It's all about you. It's a selfie, it's a selfie world. And it's like, listen, there's something greater. Actually, it's about we. If I flipped that thing around and made it about others, like this is, this is something, the beautiful thing that God is inviting us into. It's about us together. So, so, so have you carved out time for, to be connected to the body? And if you're not, I want to encourage you to do it. Not because I told you to, but because I think it's the path to, to life. Second question I want to leave you with today is, is, have you fought to find your fit? That's a lot of Fs. <laughs> uh, have you fought to find your fit? Maybe you say, well, I tried something once. I tried to get connected into a group. I tried to, I tried to volunteer. I tried and it just didn't work out and it got busy and somebody didn't get back to me and blah, blah, blah. blah and you, you, had, you had the whole list of things. Can I encourage you just to be ruthless about it? To fight until you find your fit because we need you. We desperately need you. You know, some of my favorite stories are, are the people that I know in our church are people who could be doing a lot of things. They're guys who could be making a lot of money. They're fantastic entrepreneurs, did really well before they were ever here. And these are the ones who are actually saying, listen, autonomy was never the goal. Autonomy, I, knew, I discovered autonomy never satisfied. It wasn't the answer. Actually, what satisfied was being connected and building this body. And, and, I, and I hear about guys who, you know, last year we had a group of just business guys that going, listen, I don't sing, I don't talk, I don't, you know... I'm not really good at praying. I don't really, I'm not really good at a lot of things, but I'm good at business. So they got together in a, in a room, and they said, how can we pool our resources to make an impact in the world? How can we make the world better? How can we, you know, in this new space, do some things that are entrepreneurial? And how can we raise funds to make a difference in people's life? Like, those are the beautiful things. So what is it that God has put in you? Because I know he's put some things in you. And I want to challenge you to fight ruthlessly to find them. There's a lot of ways you could do that. You can go to Next Steps, which is happening right now, so you have to wait till next month. Uh, you can go uh, to Alpha and Believe and, and Creed. And these are all places you can fill out a connection card, say help. <laughs> Somebody will actually call you if you write that. Uh, help me. I don't know how to get connected. Recognizing that you have a part to play. 
And God has put you here for a reason. You have giftings that we need them. In fact, when you don't use your giftings, the Bible says this image that when there's a part of you that doesn't function, all of you suffers. It's like, it's like an organ. It's like when an organ stops working in your body, what happens? Everything hurts, right? Everything is sore. You're like, man, I'm old. No, you, you, know, you have one thing that you need to fix. And everything begins to hurt. It's the same thing in the body. It says when one of us hurts, all of us hurt. When one of us grieves, all of us grieves. When one of us rejoices, all of us rejoice. This is what we were made for. We were made for this. So let me challenge you today to this. Have you fought to find your fit? And if you haven't and you need some help, get some help. We want to walk with you on this journey. But today, as we answer this question, why love? I believe today that you were made for this. You were made to be connected. And that satisfaction is not found in autonomy. It's found in being part of something bigger. That God has created you as an indispensable gift. Don't waste it. Plug in. Dig in. Fight to find your fit. And that as we do this, that on this side of heaven, this is the closest you get to Jesus. That as you get connected, there's going to be something in you that's going to come alive again. You're going to start to grow again. There's going to be something, even if you're 50, 60, 70, 80, that you're going to start realizing, actually, you know what? I, I, turned, I turned this thing off. I need to turn it up. I need to actually get connected. I need to start pouring my life into young people. I need to start pouring my life into groups. I'm going to fight until I find my fit because this is what God has created me for. So... Maybe for you, that's just deciding to come back next week. Maybe for some of you, that's deciding to take a step. Maybe for some of you, you're saying, I actually need to make a decision today to, to say, God, I need you to lead my life. I don't know what that looks like, but I invite you to lead me. And maybe for you, it's actually a salvation step to say, yeah, okay, I've been thinking about this long enough. I'm going to take a step with God, and I'm going to see what happens. You know, whatever that is, what is it? You need to get into group. You need to volunteer. Whatever it is, can I encourage you to take a step? And I think as we do this, if we all did this, that this is the way to change the world. Recognizing that when we function at our best, the world becomes better. Our families are better. Our communities are better. Our neighborhoods are better. Our city is better. Our region is better. Our nation becomes better. This happens because we decided to be connected and to recognize that every one of us has a part to play. So are you connected? Are you fighting for your fit? Let's pray. God, I, I thank you today for every single person that's here. And I know that every single person has unique things that they face, and some uh, come into this place believing lies about their fit. Maybe for some have believed that their giftings don't stack up against others, that they don't have anything to contribute. Maybe some have believed that this church is big, and so they don't, they don't matter. Maybe some believe all kinds of different things. That I pray that you would dispel those lies right now in the name that is Jesus that you would actually dispel those lies and, and in exchange would you give truth? Would you remind us that we were created to be connected and that as we are connected, that there is something transcendent that happens, that we experience your power and your presence and that purpose and peace we can never experience outside of you. So God, will we be connected and that we would experience your power and your presence in the middle of that? But God, even beyond that, I also pray that you would remind us that our gifts, every, every single one of us has something that we were designed to give. We were, designed, we were designed to actually to contribute and to make this, this world a better place. So God, I thank you for reminding us that everybody matters and that everyone is invited. Would we be the kind of people that invite, God, those that are in our communities, in our space, into life with us, into this body? Would we be the kind of people that remind each other and ourselves today that we all matter, we all play a part, we all have a gift? And God, I pray for anyone who's even watching online who maybe is by themselves and just wondering, why am I doing this today? Would you remind them even in this moment, God, that you've created them for something greater, that they were meant to be connected. They pulled away that today they would actually begin to walk towards connection and using their gifts. God, would you remind me, would you remind us of that? And that in, do, in so doing, God, that we would be able to see this world a better place because we're connected and we're contributing to the things that you've given us. Thank you, God, for that amazing truth today. In your name we pray. Amen. I went over time, but I want to encourage you, if you need prayer or you feel like you're alone, can I encourage you you're not? We have a prayer team that are here. would love to pray with you. And if you're not connected, please fill out a connection card. Head over to Central Connect. We'd love to see you get connected. Have an amazing week. We'll see you back here next week.